Hello everyone, my name is Brian Taylor and I'm a student of engineering at Coastal Alabama Community College and welcome to my American History 2 video assignment. For part one, I'll be reading an article written by Kelly Dietz and published by Smithsonian Magazine titled, How Enslaved Chefs Helped Shape American Cuisine. Black cooks created the feasts that gave the South its reputation for hospitality. We need to forget about this so we can heal, said an elderly white woman as she left my lecture on the history of enslaved cooks and their influence on American cuisine. Something I said, or perhaps everything I said, upset her. My presentation covered 300 years of American history that started with the forced enslavement of millions of Africans, and which still echoes in our culture today, from the myth of the happy servant, think Aunt Jemima on the syrup bottle, to the broader marketing of black servitude, as in TV commercials for Caribbean resorts targeted at white American travelers. I delivered the talk to an audience of 30 at the Mayer Museum of Art in Lynchburg, Virginia. While I had not anticipated the woman's displeasure, trying to forget is not an uncommon response to the unsettling tale of the complicated roots of our history, and particularly some of our beloved foods. It is the story of people like Chef Hercules, George Washington's chef, and Emmanuel Jones, who used his skills to transition out of enslavement into a successful career cooking in the food industry, evading the oppressive trappings of sharecropping. It is also the story of countless unnamed cooks across the South, the details of their existences now lost. But from its most famous to its anonymous practitioners, the story of Southern cuisine is inseparable from the story of American racism. It's double-edged, full of pain, but also of pride. Reckoning with it can be cumbersome, but it's also necessary. The stories of enslaved cooks teach us that we can love our country and also be critical of it, and find some peace along the way. It's not easy uncovering the histories of enslaved cooks who left few records of their own and whose stories often appear in the historical record as A-sides, incidental details sprinkled through the stories of the people who held them in bondage. In my recent study of enslaved cooks, I relied on archaeological evidence and material culture, the rooms where they once lived, the heavy cast iron pots they lugged around, the gardens they planted, and documents such as slaveholders' letters, cookbooks, and plantation records to learn about their experiences. These remnants, scant though they are, make it clear that enslaved cooks were central players in the birth of our nation's cultural heritage. In the early 17th century, tobacco farming began to spread throughout Virginia's Tidewater region. Before long, plantations were founded by colonists, such as Shirley Plantation, constructed circa 1613, Berkeley Hundred and Flowerdew Hundred, whose thousand acres extended along the James River. These large homes marked a movement of transition when English cultural norms took hold on the Virginia landscape. Traditions surrounding dining and maintaining a grand household were part of those norms, and the white gentry began seeking domestic help. At first, the cooks they hired on plantations were indentured servants, workers who toiled without pay for a contractually agreed-upon period of time before eventually earning their freedom. But, by the late 17th century, plantation homes throughout Virginia had turned to enslaved laborers captured from Central and Western Africa to grow crops, build structures, and generally remain at the beck and call of white families. Before long, these enslaved cooks took the roles that had once been occupied by white indentured servants. Black cooks were bound to the fire 24 hours a day. They lived in the kitchen, sleeping upstairs above the hearth during the winters, 
and outside come summertime. Up every day before dawn, they baked bread for the mornings, cooked soups for the afternoons, and created divine feasts for the evenings. They roasted meats, made jellies, cooked puddings, and crafted desserts, preparing several meals a day for the White family. They also had to feed every free person who passed through the plantation. If a traveler showed up day or night, bells would ring for the enslaved cook to prepare food. For a guest, this must have been delightful. Biscuits, ham, and some brandy, all made on site, ready to eat at 2.30 a.m. or whenever you pleased. For the cooks, it must have been a different kind of experience. Enslaved cooks were always under the direct gaze of white Virginians. Private moments were rare, as was rest, but cooks wielded great power. As part of the front stage of plantation culture, they carried the reputations of their enslavers and of Virginia on their shoulders. Guests wrote gushing missives about the meals and they ate while visiting these homes. While the misses may have helped design the menu or provided some recipes, it was the enslaved cooks who created the meals that made Virginia, and eventually the South, known for its culinary fare and hospitable nature. These cooks knew their craft. Hercules, who cooked for George Washington, and James Hemings, an enslaved cook at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, were both formally trained albeit in different styles. Hercules was taught by the well-known New York tavern keeper and culinary giant Samuel Francis, who mentored him in Philadelphia. Hemings traveled with Jefferson to Paris, where he learned French-style cooking. Hercules and Hemings were the nation's first celebrity chefs, famous for their talents and skills. Folklore, archaeological evidence, and a rich oral tradition reveal that other cooks, their names now lost, also weaved their talents into the fabric of our culinary heritage, creating and normalizing the mixture of European, African, and Native American cuisines that became the staples of Southern food. Enslaved cooks brought this cuisine its unique flavors, adding ingredients such as hot peppers, peanuts, okra, and greens. They created favorites like gumbo, an adaptation of a traditional West African stew, and jambalaya, a cousin of jollof rice, a spicy, heavily seasoned rice dish with vegetables and meat. These dishes traveled with captured West Africans on slave ships and into the kitchens of Virginia's elite. You also see evidence of this multicultural transformation in so-called Receipt books, handwritten cookbooks from the 18th and 19th centuries. These were compiled by slaveholding women whose responsibilities sat firmly in the domestic sphere and are now housed in historical societies throughout the country. Early receipt books are dominated by European dishes, puddings, pies, and roasted meats. But by the 1800s, African dishes began appearing in these books. Offerings such as pepper pot, okra stew, gumbo, and jambalaya became staples on American dining tables. Southern food, enslaved cook's food, had been written into the American cultural profile. For the women who wrote and preserved the receipt books, these recipes, the products of African foodways, were something worthy of remembering, recreating, and establishing as Americana. So why can't we, as Americans today, look at this history for what it was? Colonial and antebellum elite Southerners understood fully that enslaved people cooked their food. During the 19th century, there were moments of widespread fear that these cooks would poison them. And we know from court records and other documents that on at least a few occasions, enslaved cooks did slip poisons, like hemlock, into their master's food. But the country began recalibrating its memories of black cooking, 
even before the Civil War, erasing the brutality and hardships of slavery from a story of old Southern graciousness. The revisionism went full throttle during the era of Jim Crow, when new laws made segregation the norm. Post-emancipation America still relied heavily on the skills and labor of newly freed African Americans. In a highly racialized and segregated America, still grappling with its guilt over slavery, white people created a myth that these cooks were, and always had been, happy. Advertisers leaned on characters like Aunt Jemima and Rostus, stereotypical black domestics drawn from minstrel song. While newly free African Americans fled the plantations to find work as housekeepers, butlers, cooks, drivers, Pullman porters, and waiters, the only jobs they could get, Aunt Jemima and Rostus, smiled while serving white folks, enhancing the myth that black cooks had always been cheerful and satisfied during slavery and with their current situation. You can find their faces throughout early 20th century black Americana, and they are still on the grocery store shelves today, though modified to reflect a more dignified image. My angry audience member was likely raised on the old enslaved cook narrative in which these images took root, where the cook was loyal, passive, and purportedly happy, a non-threatening being whose ultimate goal was to help a white woman fulfill her own domestic vision. But to be an American is to live in a place where contradictions are the very fibers that bind a complicated heritage divided sharply by race. It is to ignore the story of Chef Hercules, or the real story of Aunt Jemima. By forgetting enslaved cooks' pain to soothe our own, we erase the pride and the achievements of countless brilliant cooks who nourished a nation. Hi, and welcome to part two of the video assignment, where I'll be preparing a cornbread recipe provided by Chef Alton Brown. And the first thing we'll be needing is two large mixing bowls. The next implement we'll need is a whisk. The final and most important implement of this entire recipe is a cast iron skillet. Now, Chef Brown's recipe calls for a 10 inch, but we're gonna be using an eight inch today. Now we'll prepare our dry ingredients, and Chef Brown's recipe calls for two cups of yellow cornmeal, and we have opted for the Aunt Jemima cornmeal in the yellow format, and one teaspoon of kosher salt, one tablespoon of sugar, two tablespoons of baking powder, and half a teaspoon of baking soda. We'll just mix this all together with our whisk, so that's how that comes in handy. And it'll come in handy again in a second. That's probably good. And now for the wet ingredients. One cup of buttermilk. Two whole eggs. And one cup of cream style corn. Then we'll whisk these together until the eggs disappear. And then, per the instructions, we're to mix the dry ingredients into the wet ingredients. And then mix until it's the consistency of loose mortar. I forgot to mention this, but once you're sure you have all of your ingredients, you may want to begin preheating your oven. Now, didn't take too much. It looks a little bit like runny grits. We want to begin by preheating our oven to 425 degrees with our cast iron skillet getting hot inside. According to Chef Brown, this next part adds spine 
to your cornbread. And what you'll do is with the pan hot, remove it, add about two tablespoons of canola oil, swirl it around in your hot pot, and that looks like a bit too much for this size pan, so I'm gonna remove a little bit of that. Next, while your pan is hot, you want to add your mix. And then bake for approximately 25 minutes. Okay, so our baking timer has gone off and I'm gonna show you guys the various methods to test whether or not your cornbread is done. So one method, which most people don't use because it's mainly for cakes, is to stick a toothpick in the center and if you remove it and there's nothing stuck to it, it's done. Now we don't have anything stuck to it, so I think we're good. But another method, which Chef Brown showed me in his video, is called the pillow test, where basically you press on it, it's very hot, and if it bounces back up like a pillow, it's done. To me, this cornbread looks done. Voila. The final step is to enjoy your cornbread as a side or amendment to your favorite meal. In this case, I've chosen potato soup. Corn is considered a vegetable, grain, and fruit. To my knowledge, no other food source has sustained humanity in the way corn has. Initially, Native Americans cultivated maize, also known as corn, and it was so integral to their lifestyle, they dedicated the plant to Atira, the goddess of the earth, and the wife of the creator god, Tarawa. The natives shared this divine plant with European settlers who spread the seeds around the world, eventually realizing corn harvests could produce more sustenance than wheat. Many American colonies turned to it as a prime resource, which led to turbulence in regards to religion, specifically the Catholics, to whom wheat was symbolic of the body of Christ. Corn was easily grown, from the colonial era to the antebellum, through the Civil War, and into Reconstruction and beyond. Corn fed the natives, the elite, the commoners, the poor, and the enslaved in the forms of cornbread, hoe cakes, cush cakes, and corn mush.